So I know we've spent quite a bit of time on air quality, and uh, it's very important because we're talking about, you know, uh, asthma, which is um, uh, very common um, chronic disease among children. A lot of people have concerns about it. So and just in general indoor air quality, uh, but also uh, for the most part in most places, accidents are the number one reason why children land up in the emergency room. So still people are being hurt all the time. So we do want to talk about keep it safe. This is about like a healthy home. Um, it was interesting, there was a, um, a study when I was in Laredo, they were doing, it was a funded study, I think it was Robert Wood Johnson came out, and they were very interested in seeing, uh, it was about pesticides and contamination. And what they did, because a lot of families were using a lot of pesticides in, in the house, so what they wanted to do is they wanted to fill a house where there was babies that crawl, and so, and they would count through the film, how many times the baby put their fingers in their mouth. And the experiment was, you know, if you put your fingers, you know, if you put your fingers in your mouth so many times and you had pesticides on the floor, you know, what kind of health impact that would have. Well, what happened was when they started looking through the film, they found out another problem that they had not thought about. The multiple times, like every five seconds, that there was a potential injury. Children running around the house with scissors, playing with knives, playing with electricity, <laughs> playing with fire. They got all of this on tape, and the whole research had to change to injury prevention because they saw the problem. But forget about the kids putting their fingers in their mouth. About every five seconds, there was one child that was almost killing another, you know, because of because of injury and because of the way the house were were built. They weren't very safe. There was a lot of um, sticks and rocks and knives and water hanging, buckets of water because the Bolognians didn't have water, so we stored water and so, you know, potential drownings. It was just, uh, they just couldn't count them fast enough. So that research actually switched over to injury prevention. So there is um, a lots of opportunity for children and others to get hurt in, in the home setting. So, so we do spend some time talking about So in order to focus our, our attentions on where we should be prioritizing our time, we will see that 43% of all injury deaths, these are injuries that result in death, come from falls. And this would be expected because um, we, now, uh, we, all, we now have a lot of older individuals that are um, living at home alone fall risks are quite real, and if older folks, if you're like above 80 and you fall and break something, you know, you're more likely to die of, of your injury. Uh, the next one, of course, is poisoning. So, still, woohoo, poisoning. <laughs> yes. So, big, still a huge, still a huge problem. This is, this is in the home, injury death, in the home. And then after poisoning, and this is poisoning of all kinds, of course, medication in there. Uh, then we have fires and burns, choking and suffocation, drowning, firearms, and then others. So really, if we're going to focus on anything, we really want to focus in on falls for elderly, poisoning for the young.
way to show a family very quickly, you know, all the potential injuries in the home and how you can prevent those. So over here you have, uh, again, with uh, number one, you have, of course, all the child safety locks and things like that. Again, when there is um, a baby shower, if I don't take them like detergent, I'll take them the little safety kit, you know, again, you know, like, thank you, Rosalia. So I don't give exciting <laughs> gifts, but they're practical. They're practical. I figure they're going to, that little dress is really cute, that little t-shirt is really cute, but they're going to outgrow those. You know, you know, I like to give a gift that's going to, you know, be be worth something uh, to them later on. So, so we have the little child safety locks. We have, of course, the gate, uh, not only uh, at the top of the stairs, the two stories, but also in the windows. I've seen kids kind of like come out of the window like this, the gate. Um, you know, again, I were, these things didn't exist when I was little. I remember when my sister came on the walker, you know, those little round walkers with little round wheels on the top of the stairs, you know, to the bottom, just wheel down. Yeah, that was funny too. You have pictures, she has like this black eye. So, <laughs> the, I was like, big sister, you should you know, like bounce down. So, uh, these things happen. Uh, three, oh, these are, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those. These okay. are like rubber, uh, rubber door handles that will be there on the door. These, we now, you have to able to squeeze the handle to open it. Yeah. It's like a child safety lock for your door. Actually, we see a lot of these in, uh, in nursing homes, especially where there's an Alzheimer's patient because they will wander out and you're not allowed to lock the doors. So you will lose people. If you don't have an eye on them, just walk out the door. And then they're lost, right? They're lost. And people say, how can they lose, you know, grandpa? You know, it's like, he just walked out. You cannot lock the doors for other safety reasons. So they'll put the, or you don't want them to walk into certain rooms. They'll put these guards on there and they don't have the strength to squeeze and open. So what they'll do is they'll just go round and round, they'll play, and then they'll forget why they were trying to go out that door. They'll just turn around and go the other way. So it's been able to uh, keep people safe in, uh, inside. Uh, let's see, four, oh, just like this, this one here, and number four up there, again, technology. We now have these water mixers uh, because scalding is a huge problem with children that they're either taking a shower, taking a bath, and then they turn on the hot water by accident, or they're just playing with it, and they'll, they'll take a second to scald someone. And that's why it's also really important that your boiler be set a little low, lower. So check out the temperature on your boiler. You want to keep it around 100 degrees. There's no reason why you want it much higher. Who's going to take a shower in 100 degree water? So, um, and people sometimes will set it high because they say, oh, but my washing machine or my dishwasher, both of those uh, equipment, they have little heaters inside that actually heat up the water. So the dishwasher <coughs> actually heats up its own water. So you don't have to keep that boiler on really hot. Uh, let's see, four, five, of course, your smoke alarm, your carbon monoxide detector is up there, carbon monoxide alarm. Uh, let's see, number seven, uh, we have these little bumpers. Uh, this is actually, this is actually strange because I hardly see these anymore. Um, most of the desks I see now are now rounded. They don't have these corners anymore. But I, I, but I remember uh, way back when you had the folding tables, you know, those big tables that you fold out, and they had like those sharp corners on the end, you know, and they're just the right height where kids can come and they'll hit their head on here. So now you see a lot of these desks and tables that have these rounded corners. Uh, not for the aesthetics, but for, for safety, um, because you can, you can hurt yourself. Uh, eight uh, are these little electrical plugs. Those are still good, those little stoppers. And I'll say, I uh, actually graduated from a and so I always hung out with a lot of engineers. <laughs> They're easy ones. <laughs> so, so, so if you hang out with engineers, they're always trying to fix things or make things better. And I remember uh, they all, in, in their dorms and in their apartments, they always had these plugs in there. I'm like, I thought those were for kids. And they're like, no, it saves electricity. This is how I sell this to families. Because 
electricity runs on a current. And the reason it's called a current is like water, like water current. So it's always circulating in your house. And if you have open plugs that don't have an appliance in there, the electricity skates through there. So if you put the plug in there, you'll actually save electricity. So they would play games. These are bad engineering games. Where they would like turn off all the lights, they turn off all the appliances and try to make the meter stop. Right? Because you, your meter never stops, even if all your lights are off. So always like looking for ways that electricity was escaping. So one of the tricks was that they would go around and put these plugs in there to try to make that meter stop completely. So fun games, <laughs> you know, it's not beer pong, but you know, it's like so fun. So, and it is a safety issue, of course, little kids, but not only for little kids, I'll tell you, that YouTube, uh, one time um, I was cooking and I heard a very loud sound in my, it was like a huge boom, something crashed in my son's room. Of course, I have a teenager, you know, they like lock themselves in their room and you never know that they're there, it's like a cave. And but I go running in, what happened? I see my son, he's like against the wall on the floor, like flailed out like this, what happened? He goes, it worked, it worked. And I'm like, what worked? He goes, he found a video on YouTube where he created, um, he created like this little fork out of aluminum foil and you put one side of your mouth and you put the other two prongs in the plug and see what happens. What well, happens? you get a huge electric shock that blows you across the room. <laughs> so he was like very proud of their work. I'm like, are you like two? You know, what is this? You never did that when you were a toddler. You know, you ever like stuck nail, you know, you're like 17 sticking stuff in the, you know, in the plug. No, we don't do that. <laughs> so it's not only just for babies. Uh, ten, um, the cords off the off the mini blinds. We still have children that hang themselves on those. So the crib should always be away from those cords. Uh, Eleven, right here. These are these uh, stoppers on the doors uh, that keep them from closing all the way. Because the problem is, like you know, the fingers get stuck on the doors and the problem with little kids is that their arms are too short to reopen the door so sometimes they're stuck there for a while so uh, we don't want that to happen that's the same reason why the minivans now when you close the doors like they like they close up really slowly because before remember it was like a bread truck <laughs> boom right you know we don't have those anymore so you know all safety issues um, let's see and then lastly, we have Quell, which is that cordless phone that's actually a great invention. Uh, some people would say it's like, oh, it's dangerous to have a phone in the bathroom, but really we would find that drownings in the home, in the tub, happen between the hours of four and six. Uh, and what happens at home between four and six? What's going on at home between four and six? People are getting home. People getting home and they are doing Cooking, answering the phone, trying to get dinner on the table, trying to get some of the kids to do their homework, cleaning up between, you know, and then you have to get the little kids into the tub. The phone rings, everyone's calling you now because they know you're at home. So and then you walk away from the phone for a second. That's all it takes. So with the invention of a phone that you can carry around with you, which is now like a mobile phone, you can actually answer the phone without leaving the little one in the tub by themselves. So that's why it was actually a good safety invention. Um, some of the uh, safety issues related to housing, when you walk in, when we're doing our, our assessments, is that there's stuff that you're gonna, you're gonna trip, you're gonna fall, uh, electrical wiring. Uh, we found this a lot, of course, in the Bolognese where we didn't have a lot of electricity, so you would use a lot of extension cords, uh, lack of uh, smoke alarms or smoke alarms without batteries. Uh, I remember when, uh, again, when we were uh, inspecting a housing unit, so I would walk in, I'd be talking to the families, and I would hear the beep, beep, beep. I'm like, okay, what is that? And they're like, what's what? And I'm like, the beep. And they're like, what beep? So that beep had been there since they moved into the apartment, so they were totally oblivious to it now. They could no longer hear it. So I would always have the community 
we never bring chemicals home from work. Because even though, you know, it's like, oh, I need Drano at home, I'll just use the one from work. A lot of those professional grade Dranos and chemicals are more concentrated, therefore they have a, a higher toxification on them. So you should not be bringing them home because those are ones that are more likely to combust. Oh, this is about Right in here, if your boiler, if your water temperature is set at 130 and a child falls in, it's going to take them 16 seconds to scald their skin off, right? But if your boiler is set at 155, it takes a second. I mean, boom, you know, they, you know, their skin has been scalded off, right? So, so it doesn't even give you a chance. So it's better that you set the temperature as low as possible. Accidents, have, you know, you know, they lean up against the, the the water. You know, they're gonna throw hot water on themselves. So that was safe. So safe is pretty, you know, straightforward. You know, the whole thing about injury prevention um, and really encouraging our families to keep that in mind that that children can hurt themselves and to keep their house as as safe as possible. And I think these are things that when we're in a home that we can. So contaminant free is talking about, and my the main two things I'm going to talk about really is just lead and a little bit of, of meth, maybe a little bit of VOCs. But we know a lot about um, tobacco smoke, not good for us, um, not for us as people, secondhand smoke, uh, not good. So we want to keep smoking outside of the home, and we're doing very well with it. I don't know, is El Paso a non-smoking? So we see that probably in the state legislature, it's gonna come out again. Uh, we're looking for a state smoking ban. We don't have that yet, it's really right now city by city. So, and there still are cities that don't have smoking bans. Uh, pesticides, you know, we talked about pesticides, and we all know the importance of keeping those, those out. VOCs, uh, those are the chemicals, uh, mercury. A lot of the older homes still have mercury because of the, uh, well, I don't know, here with the thermostats, our thermostats, you know, have, have mercury settings. And also the fluorescent light bulbs. So those became very popular for energy savings, but those are not to be thrown away in the trash because they work via mercury. And also if they fall and break, you need to be careful in how you clean them up because it's considered a hazardous material when they fall and break on the floor. No, no, the the, uh, the 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 squiggly ones, the ones that go around. Oh, both both of them. Both of them, both of them. But you're more likely to have the ones in your home. You're more likely to have the little round ones, the the little the little spiral ones. And it's the energy efficient ones. Yeah, mm -hmm. we all have those. Well, we're move, Well, now we're moving away from from the fluorescent. Now we're going over to the LED, right? So the LED. But you're not supposed to throw away those fluorescents in, in the trash. They go to hazardous material. A lot of people don't know that and they just throw them in the trash. Uh, asbestos, uh, meth labs, and then we talked about over <laughs> here about the bed bugs and roaches, and I want to just touch upon lead just a little bit. Uh, but smoking, uh, hazardous to our health, we don't want to do it. Um, but th this is real, this is real nice because it shows about how we can make culture shift in just about anything. In the early, not, this means smoke-free home rules, that basically means people who do not allow you to smoke in their home, right? You can't smoke in my house, right? That rule, whether it's verbal or internal. But in the 90s, uh, we still had, uh, let's see, about 25% uh, of the population, let's see, oh, here, it's better now, 43% were basically saying they only had um, a smoke-free home rule. That means that means like the other almost 60% still had an ashtray in their home, even though they didn't smoke, just in case somebody came by. I know we always had an ashtray in our home. Nobody smoked in our home, but if someone came, you know, you didn't want to be rude. You wanted to offer them an ashtray, and people would like light up in your house, and that didn't seem odd at all. Now, you know, if someone lights up in your house. You think that they're crazy, you're gonna like throw a bucket of water on them, you know, or you know, call 911. It's like, what are you thinking? You know, and it just
just goes to show that's really a change in behavior, a change in, in, in culture. Um, so again, if you smoke, please try to quit. And there's a lot of ways we encourage our residents. Um, again, it's all about that motivational interviewing. It gets them where they're at. We're not chastising them, but we, but we do want to know or let them know
because remember the law, the anti-lead law, it only affects paint and, uh, yeah, indoor paint. indoor paint and gasoline. Other than that, anything can have lead, you know, and we'll find lead in the uh, mini blinds, uh, practically anything that comes from China has lead, a lot of our household products, anything with plastic and the colors blue, yellow, and red will probably have lead in it. We have products that are imported products, like from, from Mexico, you know, the little, the good, like, like bean pots and stuff like that, the pottery, candy. the candy. Uh, you know, I, I almost got into a tussle with the, with the Mexican consulate because I just happened to be at an event and they were there, and I basically told people, just don't eat that candy at all. It has no nutritional value, and and a lot of it will contain lead. Oh, they found some from this place. It's a huge industry from Mexico, that candy industry, mm. especially the chili candy industry. He goes, no, well, there's a lot of a lot of um, you know manufacturers that you know do their products in a safe manner, and I don't doubt that. But as a consumer, you can't tell the difference, and it has no vitamins, it has nothing, it's just candy, and you're running the risk that it has lead. So try to stay away from it. When we have pregnant women, you know, I've seen them where they'll buy the little jars of the candy and they'll like eat it because and because pregnant women will have that that little pica, so they will. And I think they start scraping it with a little with a little spoon, and then a little piece breaks off, and then they'll like put that in their mouth and they'll chew it. After a while, they will just eat the whole thing, the whole jar and everything. I had one mom who was eating three jars a day. Um, her daughter was born so deformed. You know, it's one of those things you hate to say that, but you almost like, you know, her life is. They last. You're talking about someone that will be de defective with a low quality of life for the rest of the life, costing the taxpayer millions, and it's not about the money, but but because of the lack of education and because allowing some of these products to come in, you know, it's devastating what it can do to children. So I really see no need to take that risk. I mean, none. I mean, there there's nothing that comes. Radon, who knows what radon is? Oh, what? 
a little bit about uh, before and you know a couple of breaks was about um, now finding organizations that have resources trying to connect with other organizations uh, where as uh, groups we could actually um, bring this information uh, and resources uh, to the community I know in certain places um, that means developing maybe uh, steering or just uh, quarterly meeting around healthy homes where people can come around and talk about uh, resources or action again um, with everyone has very limited resources and but and usually there's not a budget for this but if people start to like come together sometimes a, a, a 
separate project could come of it that if there is grant funding for this uh, between CDC, HUD, and EPA, and they're always looking for new communities to find ways to integrate healthy homes, uh, it could be a matter of going to uh, working with the local elected officials and maybe changing codes or uh, encouraging more education through the city system, whether it be putting in flyers and like the, in the water bill, things like that. Uh, so we've seen all kinds of campaigns like that that have been done just through people coming together and, and discussing uh, priorities. So I know it was a lot, and I thank you because it was, we packed a lot.
along the edges of the stage so people could come and participate. I know y'all got in on early, but and and I actually came because I had another training tomorrow with a TMS. So that means that my funding is still intact for El Paso. So if like towards the end of the summer or in fall, we want to give this to like a larger group. Now you know what we're kind of like talking about. We can we can do a training to bring other people in, and I can do a Spanish one for the Solon Sodas. I can do another one similar to this for a larger group, and and that way at least it'll give you an idea of who you know you want to. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Yeah, I'm sure. I'll be going to Dallas where they're working directly with the communities and my thing is like you give me whatever time you're going to say oh we want our residents they need to have this information I go I know but residents are not going to sit down in front of you for eight hours right they will sit down in front of you for an hour I'm like give me an hour give me because all you want to do is pique their interest and that's why I say okay you're at the health fair you're not going to stand there and talk to them for an hour if you can say one thing Show them this, give them that, you know, do, you know, something I like a lot of show and tell. When you go to their house, you know, make sure and hit on certain on certain things. It doesn't take time. You just want to create awareness. And then it's funny how they become aware of one thing and they start seeing other things in their home. You know, you want to just focus their attention on this whole connection between, you know, health and housing and how there are things based on the interest of residents, I actually have shorter little trainings, like I have a training just on green cleaning, uh, I have a training just on ITM, I have a training just on safe household chemicals, and I'm willing to just share that with y'all. They're, they're just, you know, because I know sometimes all I have is an hour, and I'll ask them, what's the problem here? It's like, oh, you know, poisoning, children, chemicals, so I have one that's just on chemicals. I have one that's just on plastics. When that BPA thing came out, people were like, so what is the number, recycling number seven? What does the seven mean? You know, because at the bottom of the ball, it says seven and five. So I have like a little thing that explains all about, you know, the plastics and why, you know, you want to stay away from certain plastics, things like that. So, you know, you cannot give too much information because you don't want to overwhelm them. You don't want to overwhelm them. Because I didn't go, I didn't come on the EPA's dime uh, at this time. <laughs> I came on TMS time, so they said that's okay. Um, uh, that I kept my funding intact for El Paso, so 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 so, so I so I can so I can come back. Yeah, I can come back. So sometimes it takes that you need a small group to kind of like gain interest because sometimes people go like, what is this about? I'm not too sure. But now that you know, it's about you know who to invite. So. And it's I mean even not just. Yeah, we're thinking from the soda, but also, you know, the pediatricians, respiratory therapists, the health departments. I mean, there's, you know, HUD down the right. street right now. I love to have there's so many people, people other groups that we, yeah. you know, right. try to rope them in and, you know, whoever right. drives them and kicking and screaming or whatever, no, no, but it's right. always to make sure they have, make sure they have somebody to guide them. Yeah. But you see, sometimes you don't know until you, you know, you start now, you know, who, you know, who can bite, who's so, so that's why this is good, having a small group, and then you kind of like jump off of it. So I think that would be a great next step that if we could, you know, um, uh, if you even give me like a list of people, I can start like coordinating with them for something, you know, in whether it be in early fall, late summer. Yeah, and we're not we also we get a small grant to do some training in Alexandria, Louisiana. Oh, okay. There's a couple of healthy homes trainers in Louisiana too. Right. And 
they do, and I'll have to see if, if they're still there, um, uh, you know, to also partner up because because they have local contacts and, and they have that great accent that I just have not been able to <laughs> replicate. We need to give it a chance.